This meeting is now being recorded. Well, again, good evening. Welcome to the EDS Awareness Educational Series webinar. My name is John Furman. Before we introduce our speaker for this evening, we'd like to give an overview of our free program to those attending for the first time. Again, my name is John Furman. I manage the National EDS Awareness Program based in Cincinnati, Ohio. My daughter, Deanna, leads the Cleveland, Ohio support group. She was diagnosed with EDS in 2008, the same year my wife passed away with breast cancer. I was a caregiver for my wife who struggled with undiagnosed EDS for over 30 years. Our agenda tonight, we're going to go over who we are, what is our program, some upcoming events, and we're going to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Posinke, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So we introduced our program in 2012 at the EDMF conference to help EDSers form independent local support groups and spread EDS awareness in their communities. We've started over 60 groups to date. Each group is given their own free website with a link from the directory and map. Last month, we attended as a sponsor for the EDF conference for the third time. We had a great response for our program. Uh, we've added some additional groups, two in Australia, one in New Zealand is coming along. We have a potential in Alaska and one in the UK, so we're continuing to add groups to our map. We receive feedback that conferences provide valuable information and social opportunities for many who cannot afford physically or financially to attend in person. So we decided to bring the speakers to you through the free EDS Awareness Educational Series. We meet every first and third Wednesday, typically at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. All the programs are free. The meeting announcements and whenever possible, the webinar recordings will be posted on our website at edsawareness.com for a later replay. You can receive email announcements for future sessions by requesting the free report on our site. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Body Support Store, where you will find over 250 products selected by EDSers for EDSers. The store is the only funding for the program, and it usually covers our monthly web fees. So please visit our store and check out some of the helpful products that we sell. So just a, a general disclaimer, this presentation contains general information about EDS. Members of the EDS community voluntarily participate in this program. The information is not advice. If you are having mental problems now, please call 911. Always consult your doctor before making any changes to treatment. Upcoming events, our speaker for September 3rd will be Dr. Ann Maitland. She's the Director for Comprehensive Allergy and Asthma Care at the New Mast Cell Activation Center of New York. Her topic is titled Prevalence of Mast Cell Activation Syndrome Among Those with Connective Tissue Disorders. I just wanted to remind you, after tonight's presentation, there will be an opportunity for live Q&A. Add your questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A icon located at the top of your screen. After typing your question, click the orange button to submit. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Alan Pasinki. His topic is breaking the cycle of chronic pain, poor sleep, depression, and fatigue in Ehlers-Danlos. 
Dr. Pasinki received his degree from the Cornell University Medical College and completed his internship and residency at Washington Hospital Center. He is a clinical associate professor at George Washington University Medical Center and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Pasinki was honored by the DC Medical Society which, with its Distinguished Service Award and he has served as the president of the DC Society of Internal Medicine and was named the National Young Internist of the Year by the American Society of Internal Medicine in 1997. He has also been named one of the top primary care doctors in Washington by patient votes and one of Washingtonians Magazine's top doctors by his peers. Dr. Prasinki serves on the EDNF Professional Advisory Network. So welcome, Dr. Pasinki. We're looking forward to your presentation, and you'll see your slides loading on the screen. I'm going to go ahead and turn over the microphone to you now. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, John, for hosting, and welcome, everybody, this evening. Uh, I'm not sure about thanking you for saying that I was young in terms of the year in 1997. It kind of makes me feel old. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome, everyone, and I guess we'll we'll jump right in. So I have to mention this in addition to John's disclaimer, I have no particular financial conflicts of interest to disclose. I certainly will be discussing uh, off-label uses of many medications. I'm not aware of any medications that are specifically indicated for treatment of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So. so this is our topic tonight. We're talking about the vicious cycle of chronic pain, poor sleep, depression, and fatigue. Um, and how each one of these feeds and aggravates the others, and how to really improve any of them, you need to improve all of them. And just so, this, just so you think I'm not the only person who has these ideas, uh, I happen to come across this quotation from Myopain's the big international pain meeting. Um, last year where in his welcoming remarks, uh, Dr. Meese, after just a few sentences about the nature of chronic pain, stated that every patient with chronic widespread pain requires evaluation of sleep since poor sleep and depression are independently associated with pain. So as I said, to break the cycle, you really need to address everything simultaneously. Uh, that doesn't mean you're going to start a whole pile of pills all in the same day, uh, but it means that as long as you're in pain, your sleep and your depression and your fatigue will never completely resolve. As long as you're depressed, you're going to be more sensitive to pain, you're not going to sleep well, and you're going to be tired. Um, and the other point that I probably don't have to emphasize too much to this audience is there is no magic formula, and that is because everyone is different. Uh, no two of you have the same identical symptoms uh, and how patients respond to symptoms and to medications, uh, how they respond to their illness is going to vary with specific psychological factors about who they are and what their coping and support systems and mechanisms are like, as well as physiologic factors like how healthy they were before they got sick, uh, other medical conditions they might have that might interact with, Ehlers-Danlos related problems, uh, pharmacogenetics, that is how Genetically, different people metabolize different drugs differently, uh, as well as other genetic factors. So again, sort of goes without saying, I think I'm getting the argument from this crowd that uh, every patient requires a comprehensive, individualized treatment plan. So let's look at each of these components in a little more depth. Um, so how do we get pain under control? How do we address pain? Well, it's a little oversimplified or whatever, but unfortunately not so obvious to physicians, I think, that different types of pain require different treatments. So figuring out what type of pain you're having uh, is going to be the first step in trying to figure out what the most successful treatment approaches are going to be. Um, I tend to think of um, pain either by parts of the body affected, that is the musculoskeletal system, or visceral pain, 
uh, and headache is kind of its own thing because there are so many different types of headaches. Uh, muscle and joint pain, of course, is, is widespread in the other um, and I tend to think of that pain as being either inflammatory, mechanical, or neuropathic. Uh, inflammatory pain is typically the the soft tissue strain, the strain on muscles around the joints from trying to stabilize the loose joints. Uh, mechanical pain is most often the chronic muscle spasm that develops from these constantly strained muscles. Uh, and then neuropathic pain is the uh, the burning, the stinging, the um, the increased sensitivity to minor uh, trauma or even to light touch that unfortunately comes with chronic pain. Uh, visceral pain uh, typically affects as pain that affects the internal organs uh, in the setting of allostanlos. That's probably most often gastrointestinal, uh, and that itself can be inflammatory or mechanical or neuropathic. Rarely, it's ischemic, meaning lack of blood flow or lack of oxygen to certain body tissues. Uh, and then headache could be a talk unto itself. I can think of 10, 12, 15 different types of headaches that patients with allostanlos are predisposed to. So the other big um, uh, the other big concept in managing pain is don't underestimate it, uh, and this is a problem for patients as well as physicians. Um, patients tend to say things like, "Well, it's not that bad. I'm used to it. I've learned to live with it. I've had it for a long time. I can put up with it. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of pain medication." Uh, and that's really, as I think you'll see, as I hope you'll see, that those that approach to managing chronic pain is really not helpful uh, to say, you know, it's not that bad, I can put up with it, uh, ignores the fact that being in pain all the time is going to make you tired, it's going to make you depressed, and it's going to ruin the quality of your sleep. So like pain, different types of depression require different treatments. Uh, different people manifest or experience depression in different ways. I tend to find uh, one of the more helpful ways of subdividing symptoms of depression uh, is to look at the symptoms that are associated typically with the major neurotransmitters, and that is with deficiency of the major neurotransmitters. Um, and that I think may be easier to see on this Venn diagram. I hope this the print is not too small for this, but um, typically uh, lack of serotonin is associated with worry and obsessive compulsive symptoms and anxiety and things like that. Uh, low levels of dopamine are associated with lack of motivation, lack of pleasure, nothing's fun, you don't look forward to anything. Um, and low levels of norepinephrine are associated with enhanced sensitivity to pain and problems with uh, fatigue, concentration, uh, as well as mood. So it's an oversimplification, but it's very helpful for patients in understanding why different medications might help different symptoms and why, in fact, they might need a combination of medications to optimally manage their depression. So again, like pain, it's important to realize that depression is not something to be ignored or underestimated. Uh, patients tend to say, again, it's not that bad. I'm used to it. I've learned to live with it. Uh, wouldn't you be depressed too? Uh, I don't need counseling. I don't want to take antidepressants. Uh, those approaches generally are not helpful because as long as depression remains untreated, there's going to be enhanced sensitivity to pain, there's going to be fatigue, and there's going to be poor sleep. And a couple other important points here. Um, a lot of people don't realize you don't have to be sad to be depressed. Uh, as you read those symptoms on the, on the Venn diagram, you can have symptoms uh, primarily that are fatigue or lack of interest um, as your primary symptoms of depression. And similarly, you can have significant deficiencies in these various neurotransmitters uh, without uh, meeting the textbook criteria of clinical depression. So sleep, again, no surprise. You sort of recognize the pattern here that, that just as with depression and pain, we need to figure out exactly what's wrong with sleep in order to tailor a specific treatment for each patient. Um, many patients will have difficulty getting to sleep, uh, and there are many different things that will contribute to trouble falling asleep, the big ones being probably uh, anxiety, pain, um, worry, uh, environmental factors like noise or an uncomfortable mattress, 
Um, some people will fall asleep okay, but then wake up frequently during the night, and trouble staying asleep uh, is additionally associated with pain very often, but often with sleep apnea or snoring, and occasionally people have very vivid dreams that disrupt their sleep, and movement and movement-related disorders can also disrupt the continuity of sleep. And then people who wake up often and have trouble getting back to sleep, really uh, essentially this entire list can contribute to that. So there are many things that contribute to getting a non-restful or what we call non-restorative sleep, uh, and often it's not just one problem, often it's many problems, and again, all of them need to be treated at the same time to get uh, a good restful night's sleep. So again, same problem as we have with depression and pain, people tend to really underestimate how bad their sleep is. Um, they'll say, well, it's not that bad. Uh, a common response when I ask people, how's your sleep, they'll say, not terrible. <laughs> so, well, that's, <laughs> I guess that's better than terrible. Um, but uh, again, I'm used to it. I've never been a good sleeper. I hear a lot. Um, I don't want to take sleeping pills. Uh, again, if you don't address your sleep problems, no matter how well you do everything during the day, if you don't get a rest and night's sleep, you're really never going to feel better. And so almost more than with, with uh, pain and depression, uh, there's a major problem with what I call sleep misperception, um, that a lot of people think they're sleeping well when they're not. Um, They'll say, oh, I'm a great sleeper. I can sleep anytime, anywhere. I can sleep 10, 12, 14 hours, no problem. And I say, well, I think that means you're not a good sleeper. And they're, they have trouble, <laughs> trouble with that one. Uh, and even people who ask, you know, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? Do you feel rested when you get up in the morning? Uh, and a typical response is, well, I guess so. And so then I say, well, do you feel like you want to go back to sleep for another couple of hours? I say, well, yeah, doesn't everybody? Um, and so this is not a unique problem to, to patients with ehlers Uh There are studies that have shown that up to 90% of patients with sleep apnea don't know they have it. Um, and I occasionally will be surprised by somebody that I think is not sleeping well because of pain and they have a sleep study and it turns out they do have problems with pain, but they also have significant sleep apnea that they have no symptoms of and their, their partners weren't aware of. Um, similarly, patients with periodic limb movements can move around quite a bit at night and not be aware of that at all. And then finally, the most important thing here is that the major problems with the quality of sleep that we see in the Danlos are frequent arousals, that is disruptions to the continuity of sleep, and a lack of deep sleep. And those two common problems really do not cause any particular symptoms except fatigue on waking up, that you just feel that you're not as rested, you're not refreshed when you've woken so that's why sleep studies are very helpful because patients are not really aware of major problems, apnea, movement, arousals, lack of deep sleep. Uh, those are things that patients are often unaware of, and sleep studies will show you exactly what's going on. The caveat here is that you need to look at your sleep study pretty carefully. Um, most sleep uh, most sleep physicians are looking for sleep apnea and are looking for periodic limb movements but are not familiar with things like frequent arousals and lack of deep sleep as being significant problems. Home sleep monitoring can be very helpful in showing what, whether and confirming whether sleep at home really looks like what your sleep was like in the sleep lab and also to see how you're responding both to changes in medication or to changes in other environmental factors and how those might affect your sleep. Uh, unfortunately, the best of the home monitors, the company went bankrupt about a year ago. Um, currently available monitors have some limitations. I'm hopeful that some of the um, so-called actigraphs, things like Jawbone and Fitbit and Basis, um, and there are and other uh, sleep apps available for smartphones are going to gradually improve and, and become more useful. So here's a graphic. Let me activate my cursor here um, to show what uh, a typical appearance of a normal sleep study and then the sleep study of an ehlers Danlos patient who wakes up feeling tired. So here in the, in the top picture, you see the stages of sleep through the night. So green is shallow sleep, blue is deep sleep, 
shallow. Red is REM, shallow. Gives you a little more deep sleep here. Shallow REM, shallow REM, shallow REM. So you see there's a cycle here through the different stages of sleep with most of the deep sleep early in the night. So the lower picture here is the sleep study of um, a young woman who was tired all the time and felt like she actually had a pretty good night's sleep this night in the sleep lab. And as you can see, she has no deep sleep. She has almost no REM. She has nothing that looks like a cycle. What you can't see here is that in the sleep lab, we define an awakening as a disruption to the continuity of sleep that lasts more than 30 seconds. It turns out most people need to be awake for at least two minutes to remember having been awake. And if the continuity of your sleep is disrupted for less than 30 seconds, we call that an arousal. So this person remembered waking up twice during the night. She actually woke up 23 times, and she had 125 arousals. So the continuity of her sleep was disrupted 150 times, and she was only aware of two of them. Uh, hence the value of having the sleep study to see what's really going on while you're sleeping. Oh, and I put in this slide, um, this is the doctor looking at the patient, says the MRI reveals that your head is riddled with conventional wisdom. Um, that's to make the unfortunate footnote that it should be the patient usually telling his doctor to forget conventional wisdom because, unfortunately, the previous sleep study that I just showed you was read as normal, uh, despite the 150 arousals, was read as normal by a board-certified sleep doctor. So um, when I last made this presentation, uh, one of the one of the questions that I caught to that was a very good question, which is, okay, if we can't trust the sleep doctors to read our sleep studies correctly, what should we be looking for in the report? So I added the slide, uh, and the, the major problems are, um, as I mentioned, arousals and awakenings. So arousals will usually be divided into respiratory arousals, those related to sleep apnea, uh, that is complete stopping of breathing, to hypopneas, which is just a, a shallow breathing, um, RERAs are respiratory-related arousals that don't meet the criteria for either being a hypopnea or an apnea, but still disrupt the continuity of sleep, uh, continuity of sleep, and then snoring. And sometimes snore arousals will be listed separately, and sometimes they're included with the RERAs. And then there are movement-related arousals uh, related to so-called periodic limb movements of sleep. Uh, the important thing to look at there is not how many limb movements there were, but how many arousals related to limb movements. There were, uh, I just saw a study today where the person had uh, 59 limb movements during the course of the night, and the number of movement-related arousals was zero. Uh, and unfortunately, the sleep doctor nevertheless recommended that the patient be given medication to suppress his movement. And then, by definition, any arousals that are not movement-related or not respiratory-related are referred to as spontaneous. Uh, clearly, and I hope I'll convince you tonight that they're not spontaneous, there's a reason why people have these arousals that are not respiratory and not movement related. And then in addition to arousals, usually awakenings will be listed separately in the sleep study. And besides looking at arousals and awakenings, the other thing to look at is the percentage of deep sleep, uh, which in most sleep labs is not going to be referred to as N3. Uh, some old labs may still refer to this as stage 3 and stage 4, in which case you want to combine stage 3 and stage 4 uh, to get your total deep sleep. Um, Normal percentage of deep sleep is about 15 to 20 percent of your total night's sleep. Uh, unfortunately, normal in ehlers danlos patients typically is in the single digits. So here's a graph just to show um, in the top row here heart rate and in the bottom row, again, stages of sleep with the top line here being awake. And you can see that each one of these big spikes that's an awakening lines up pretty much exactly with a spike in heart rate as if there are little surges of adrenaline, if you will, throughout the night that are causing the disruptions. More typically, we'll see something that looks like this, where in the top slide, you can probably use a little imagination and see that there actually is a cycle here, and that this patient is cycling through shallow sleep and deep sleep and back into shallow sleep and REM. Um, but unfortunately, superimposed on this are these frequent disruptions. So the patient here is like getting into deep sleep, but then back into shallow sleep, back into deep, back into shallow, back into deep, back into shallow. Um, and 
the software and the sleep study may actually add up all these little bits uh, and overestimate the amount of deep sleep that this person actually got. Um, if you look at the bottom slide, this is the bottom tracing here, this is the patient's heart rate. So while you're asleep, your heart should be asleep. It should be calm and steady and quiet. Um, and instead, this person is running around or playing tennis all night long. Uh, heart rate is up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And again, if you took a ruler, you could you could see how each one of these little heart rate spikes lines up with a with an awakening. Um, so instead of having a calm, restful sleep, for some reason, this person's whole autonomic nervous system is being overactive over all night when it should be calm. Uh, I put in this slide just to show, for whatever reason, this patient had an, almost an hour here where her heart was calm and quiet and everything was as it should be, and she got a decent chunk of uninterrupted deep sleep. But the rest of the night, you can see that she's up a couple dozen times, and her heart is bouncing around all night long. So uh, this is the um, best place, I think, to bring in the topic of autonomic dysfunction, which is common in Ehlers Danlos and unfortunately pretty much aggravates pain and fatigue and mood and sleep. Uh, so it's yet another complicating factor. So for those of you to whom this is a, a new concept, uh, the autonomic nervous system basically is the part of the nervous system that regulates everything that happens automatically. Uh, heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, digestion, everything that goes on without your having to consciously think about it. Uh, and it's a fairly simple system. It's divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic is the fight or flight response or can be thought of as generally the accelerator when you need to speed things up or respond to stress, you hit the gas. And the parasympathetic nervous system is the break, it's rest and digest. Eating stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system, and when you're resting, you want to take your foot off the gas and put your foot on the brake. So the problem with autonomic dysfunction in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is, is um, best described as instability or what I call failure to modulate, that there are little things in your body that need to be adjusted constantly uh, but in patients with autonomic problems, they're not kept on an even keel. They're allowed to fluctuate too much. And one of the, the um, um, simplest constructs that I, that I find to, um, makes it a little easier to understand uh, is the concept of having an adrenaline reserve. And this is, I stress this is purely a construct. Uh, you don't really have a reserve of adrenaline. Um, but the idea is that uh, if you're getting a decent restful night's sleep, you're putting gas in the tank so that during the day you can use it up for your normal daily activities. If you don't get a decent night's sleep and you still have to do a lot of stuff during the day, you'll end up dipping into your reserves to try to get through the day. And then you don't sleep well and you have to push it the next day. And over time, your reserves get depleted. The paradox in these conditions is that the more the reserves get depleted, instead of being more sluggish and tired, instead you get more anxious and irritable and your body overreacts to minor stresses. So you're trying to conserve what little energy you have left and your body keeps wasting it by overreacting to small things. And generally people's family members recognize this tendency to over-respond to minor things. Then once you hit the gas too hard, that will often trigger your body to overcorrect and hit the brake too hard. And then you might hit the gas too hard. And this graphically looks like the picture on the left is normal. The picture on the right is a patient with Ehlers-Danlos and autonomic dysfunction. Um, and I will just point out to you here, uh, this point right here, the patient is asked to stand. And normally, since your blood pressure tends to drop when you stand, there's an increase in sympathetic activity. Your body hits the gas, increases your heart rate and your blood pressure a little bit to compensate for the drop in blood pressure when you stand. In somebody who's exhausted from years of chronic pain and poor sleep, what happens is they hit the gas too hard. Almost instantaneously, the body says, whoa, wait a minute, heart rate's gone up too fast, blood pressure's gone up too fast, and they hit the brake even harder, 
then come crashing down. And that's the basis of or the static intolerance or lightheadedness on standing uh, or um, fainting for a lot of people. Uh, and this person didn't have any symptoms, didn't faint, because quickly your body recognized, oh, too low, better at the gas again. Oh, too much gas, better at the brake. No, 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 that's too low, better at the gas again. Uh, and so she's been standing for three minutes, and her body's still struggling trying to get her heart rate and her blood pressure evened out. Uh, and again, compare how much energy in the red that she is wasting compared to the little bit of energy that a normal person uses, and you see the problem of um, daily activities, something like standing up, aggravating fatigue, and aggravating autonomic dysfunction. So what happens when you get a surge of adrenaline? Something stressful happens. Uh, most people are probably familiar with that. You're anxious, you're upset, you're angry, the adrenaline kicks in, your heart starts to pound, your chest gets tight, maybe you feel a shorter breath, your neck tends to tighten up, you feel jittery, you feel restless, uh, you want to run, you want to fight, you want to you want to tackle whatever the problem is. Um, sometimes you'll either get shaky or uh, feel nervous, be flushed, be hot and sweaty, become irritable. Um, you certainly can have trouble falling or staying asleep if you're in this fight or flight mode. And the other thing that happens is when you've got your foot on the gas, you take your foot off the brake, so digestion tends to slow down. If, for whatever reason, your body decides it's time to hit the brake, if you hit the brake too hard, that typically causes nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea, chills, cold sweat, causes your heart rate and your blood pressure to fall, and generally makes you feel bad. Uh, I saw two young women in the last couple of days who came in complaining of persistent nausea uh, for several weeks, and the cause of their nausea had nothing to do with their digestive system. They were nauseous because they were so overtired and in so much pain, they were making adrenaline in response to fatigue and pain. And unfortunately, the adrenaline then tends to mask the fatigue and the pain, so they really didn't realize how bad things were. But their body was desperate to get them to slow down, so it made them nauseous to make them feel bad, make them feel weak, dizzy, and have to stop and slow down. So, again, to look at these similar symptoms, this concept of over-responding to minor stresses, um, if there's a minor stress that your body perceives as danger in some way, uh, you can over-respond to pain. So, again, here's our autonomic problems exaggerating the problem of, of chronic pain. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned, families notice uh, patients' tendency to irritability. Uh, and patients themselves will say, well, gee, why did I, you know, why did they make such a big deal about that? Uh, and, they'll, and they'll often realize that it was, you know, it was an overreaction, but they're not. They can't help it. Um, distractibility is a, is a major problem. It's hard to maintain your focus when you're in this fight-or-flight state. Uh, and, of course, sleep is a problem uh, if you've got your foot on the gas and your heart's racing and your body is looking for some danger. Um, if you're... If your body then decides to see that there's something parasympathetic happening, like you're eating, it may over-respond to that and make you dizzy or lightheaded or queasy. Uh, similarly, if you're, um, it can cause uh, problems with exercise tolerance. Um, I just saw a 19-year-old last week who, whenever he tried to do anything strenuous, unfortunately he would throw up because he didn't realize how exhausted he was, and every time he hit the gas hard, his body would hit the brake hard. And uh, it wasn't until he had thrown up eight times during one game of Ultimate Frisbee that he decided to let his mom take him to the doctor. So fatigue is the, is the last part of our cycle of, of uh, pain, fatigue, poor sleep, and depression. Uh, and like the others, different causes of fatigue retire, require different treatments. As we've just discussed, much of the fatigue in the other comes from poor sleep and chronic pain and depression and autonomic problems, but that doesn't mean that those are the only causes of fatigue. There are many other factors, uh, and certainly common ones need to be looked for. Uh, and the common metabolic factors, uh, anemia is not common, but it's, it's something important to look for. Hypothyroidism is fairly common, um, and other common uh, other common medical uh, causes of fatigue. In the other standalone population, 
Uh, micronutrient deficiencies are very common, uh, especially vitamin D and B12 deficiencies and magnesium deficiencies, uh, and all of those are associated with significant fatigue as well as uh, D and magnesium deficiencies associated with uh, muscle and joint pain. Hormone deficiencies can be a major factor in fatigue in Ehlers-Danlos patients. Um, cortisol often is not regulated well. It often tends to fluctuate to extremes uh, just the way the autonomic nervous system does. Some patients have unexpectedly low, unexpectedly high cortisols, which can cause a variety of problems. Uh, just in the past year, I've been collecting some data and finding that most of my um, women, Ehlers-Danlos patients, are deficient in DHA and testosterone, which I believe is quite significant because, among other things, it's hard to build the muscle tone that you need to build to stabilize your loose joints when you have little or no androgen, when you have little or no male hormone in your system. Uh, salt fluid imbalance is a very common problem in, in Ehlers-Danlos. Um, and again, what I found looking at the details of this is that 80 to 90 percent of my patients who have been told to eat lots of salt and drink lots of water are getting too much water and not enough salt. Uh, many patients are told to drink lots of water, and they think the more water they drink, the better. Uh, and it's not unusual for me to see people drinking four, five, and six liters of water a day, and it's impossible to maintain your, your salt fluid balance with that much intake of plain water. Mitochondrial disorders are not common, but I included them just because uh, there is a, I think, growing awareness that there's an increased incidence of mitochondrial problems in the Ehlers-Danlos population. So just to get into a little more details, because this is something that um, uh, goes counter to conventional wisdom that uh, is usually given to people with orthostatic intolerance to say, well, if you're lightheaded, you should be drinking more water. Um, what I've done is just to look at salt fluid balance at a, at a very sort of gross level uh, is to look at the total concentration of everything in the blood or the serum osmolality. Normal there is between 280 and 300, and almost all of my Ehlers-Danlos patients live right around 280, 279, 280, 281, 276. Um, and then at the same time, we look at the concentration of the urine because if the urine is very dilute, then that tells us that the kidneys are trying to get rid of the water that these people have been drinking in order to get the concentration of their blood back up. So in essence, when you're drinking plain water, I tell people, think about every time you drink plain water as diluting out the concentration of your blood. And then in order to get the concentration of your blood back up, you need to either pee out the water you just drank or you need to hold out the salt to to balance things out. Um, and in fact, as I as I you know, to my initial surprise, uh, most people I see have very low urine osmolality. So there's something wrong with the kidneys. The kidneys are doing what they're supposed to be doing, um, but they're having to dump most of the plain water people are drinking in order to keep the concentration of the blood up. So, again, most people who are told to eat lots of salt and drink lots of water are getting too much water and not enough salt. The best solution, or at least the simplest solution, is to replace plain water with electrolyte drinks, um, but be careful because a lot of commercially available electro electrolyte drinks have lots of sugar in them. Uh, there are now, I think, Powerade Zero, Gatorade Zero, I think there are some some now widely available ones that do not have extra sugar in them. Generally, I tell people to limit plain water intake to less than half of their daily fluid intake um, and forget the conventional wisdom that salt is bad for you because most people need extra salt. And again, most people don't need more than two or three liters of fluid a day. If you're drinking four, five, six liters of water a day, you'll never you'll never achieve salt fluid balance. So, how do we break the cycle of chronic pain, poor sleep, fatigue, and depression? Well, we go through each one one at a time and try to identify the underlying factors. What's causing poor sleep? Uh, is there undiagnosed sleep apnea? Uh, is there too much adrenaline disrupting sleep overnight. Uh, what type of pain is it? How are we going to how are we going to go about addressing these specific factors and trying to put all of these treatments together in a comprehensive treatment program? So when we sit down to do this, um, it's pretty important to sort of say, okay, what are some realistic goals? So I saw somebody yesterday who said she realized that 
100% pain relief and not being in any pain at all was really unrealistic. Um, but feeling better, having less pain, uh, if you're somebody who counts your pain on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, getting your daily 4, 5, 6 down to a 1 or 2 uh, is, is generally an achievable goal. Getting down to 0 is probably not realistic. And for most people, uh, improving how they feel and improving their ability to work, manage your family, manage a household, uh, those are realistic goals. Somebody who's disabled, wanting to go back to their 75-hour-a-week job, is probably not a realistic goal. And then another question is, are there limitations to treatment options? There's a whole long list of options we can draw from. Some of them may be not feasible, either for financial reasons or logistical reasons, such as geography. And then there may be some other medical problems that we have to take into account when choosing treatments for Ehlers-Danlos related problems. And then, of course, occasionally we run into a situation where a patient just does not want to consider certain treatments, and, and that's fine. The patients have specific preferences of what appeals to them. Uh, and there's an interesting study just coming out this week on what's called the nocebo effect and how um, uh, what patients believe about a treatment and what doctors tell them about a treatment uh, enhances has a great effect on whether they're uh, how they respond to that particular treatment. So, just to make our lives more difficult, we have to remember that all these symptoms and all these different systems that are affected are parts of a whole, and we have to be careful that treating one treating one problem doesn't make another problem worse. Unfortunately. I know many patients and some of you on the call probably tonight have had the feeling of being a whack-a-mole where every time you fix one problem, another one or another two may pop up. So ideally, we try to choose treatments that might address multiple problems. So this is another way to look at uh, an overall treatment program is by putting fatigue in the center of our little diagram saying, okay, um, how are we going to feel better? How are we going to have more energy? Well, we need to get our depression under control. We need to get pain under control. We need to get more restful like sleep. Um, and in order to address fatigue as well as to address autonomic dysfunction, um, a couple years ago, I made this little cartoon uh, as a simple answer to the question of, okay, what do I have to do to get better? And again, this is oversimplified, and every time I look at the slide, I tend to add something to it. Uh, but the major point here is that Energy tends to be limited, and the problem of fatigue in Ehlers-Danlos, I think, is not a mystery, that sleep is the major the major opportunity to put gas in the tank, and there are many other stresses that are using it up. So um, it's no surprise that most patients on most days are using up more energy than they put in the tank the night before, and they need to somehow reverse that trend, both by optimizing the quality of sleep and by trying to reduce as much as possible the stresses that drain energy. So pain is a big one. Uh, fatigue is listed. Uh, the reason fatigue drains energy is because the tendency in our society is to suck it up and push through the fatigue. And there are things you have to do no matter how tired you are, you're going to do them anyway. Or, gee, I really wanted to finish this task today. Even though I'm exhausted, I'm going to just keep going anyway. And that's not helpful. That makes the whole problem worse. Uh, as we talked about dehydration, is a common and, and easily fixable uh, drain on energy. If you stand up and you're lightheaded because you're dehydrated, then your body's got to waste energy trying to keep your heart rate and blood pressure up, trying to keep blood going to your brain. Um, cognitive effort, I often have to remind people who are still trying to work that cognitive effort burns just as many calories as physical effort does. So they have to uh, factor that into their, their budget equation, their energy budget for the day. Uh, emotional stresses uh, obviously tend to be draining, and then energy that's used for work or school or family chores. So again, I think it's, it's um, um, no mystery here that most chronically ill patients are going to be using up more energy than they're putting in, and we need to reverse that. So big challenge. We've got to put together this treatment program, how we've got to, many choices, how are we going to choose what's best for each patient. So I do want to emphasize that this is not all about medication. Uh, there are many things that people can do, such as, as I mentioned, fatigue, uh, the importance of not plowing through fatigue, of resting when you're tired is a simple thing that people can do. Um, exercise is important, 
Many patients at home too tired to exercise, but most people can do some level of exercise. Um, adjusting sleep schedules so that you sleep on regular hours is important. Eating regular hours, uh, not eating overly heavily, heavy meals. We talked about salt and fluid intake. Uh, lots of things that you can do to adjust your daily activities. And then there are, of course, non-pharmacologic treatments for pain, depression, sleep, and fatigue. So just to mention a few things to manage pain, uh, exercise is often helpful. It has to be done carefully. Um, it's easy to hurt yourself by exercising too much. It's easy to aggravate your fatigue by exercising too much. Uh, and for many patients, exercise, uh, for my patients, begins flat on their back, moving their arms and legs around without having to fight gravity um, and without any risk of strain or injury. Um, physical therapy can, be, therapy can be very helpful. Massage can be very helpful. Uh, that You have to be careful at both extremes. Somebody who does too good a job of getting all your tight muscles to relax may make your loose joints more loose. And at the other extreme, somebody who's into deep tissue massage may mash too hard on your sore tight muscles and just make them hurt more. Uh, acupuncture, dry needling, tens, many other approaches that are useful for certain people in certain, certain situations. So when we look at pain medications, uh, the real point of this slide is that it's not a very long list. Um, you have anti-inflammatories, you have Tylenol and Tramadol, you have muscle relaxants, uh, you have Cymbalta and Cybella and antidepressants that have some pain effects. You have uh, Neurontin and Lyrica, and then you have narcotics. Uh, and topicals are useful for patients who have, you know, uh, localized areas, uh, neck, one shoulder, one hip, that are painful. Um, but it's a fairly short list. In terms of managing depression, anxiety, stress, and basically taking less out of the tank uh, in that uh, in that department, um, there's an awful lot of measures, and again, different things are more effective for different people, but in general, improving your psychological supports, having a more positive outlook, uh, the concept of empowerment that you need to have a treatment program, you need to know what your role in the treatment program is, what you need to do to get better, uh, is very empowering for people and often helps improve their their outlook. If you don't think there's any light at the end of the tunnel, you're not going to get there. Um, Managing stress is really important because your body is tending to overreact to stress. So trying to reduce the, the stresses uh, and avoid them as much as possible or let somebody else deal with them, uh, but also trying to modify the way the body responds to stress can be very helpful. Um, and in that situation, uh, relaxation techniques such as deep breathing or meditation uh, and calming exercises like yoga and tai chi can be very helpful. Uh, and then there are non-pharmacologic measures where you sort of need someone else's help. Um, counseling obviously can be helpful. Uh, clinical hypnotherapy is useful in specific cases of people, for example, who are having trouble getting things to shut down at bedtime. Um, and more complicated systems like EEG neurofeedback and EMDR uh, are helpful for other people. So I go back to this um, uh, diagram here because this, as I mentioned, is something that I find very useful in um, choosing among antidepressants and how to decide which antidepressant might be effective for which person. I look at, okay, what are their predominant systems and symptoms and how do they match up with this? So um, typically medications for depression, again, it's a pretty short list. Uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the combination serotonin norepinephrine drugs, uh, well, butrin primarily affects dopamine, um, uh, and then there are so-called augmenting agents uh, like Abilify, Circla, and Limantil, which are not antidepressants themselves, but will boost the antidepressant effect uh, of antidepressant medications that patients have had a partial response to. And I always make the point here, because I see this almost every day, that benzodiazepines like Valium and Xanax and Ativan and Clonopin are not antidepressants. Uh, in fact, they're downers. They make depression worse. And a lot of people, um, I think, mistake their anxiety, which may be an autonomic symptom, um, for a symptom of depression and treat it with benzodiazepines and unwittingly make their depression as well as their fatigue and their any cognitive problems they might have worse. 
many non-pharmacologic measures to improve the quality of sleep, basics of good sleep hygiene, only using your, using your bed um, for sleep so that your body knows that when you're in bed you're supposed to be sleeping. Uh, comfortable matches is really important. Uh, I'm amazed how many people still say, well, I even learn to ask people, how old is your mattress? Uh, and people are sleeping on 20- and 30-year-old mattresses and wondering why their back hurts when they wake up in the morning. Um, it's very important because your body's overly sensitive to stimuli that your room be particularly dark and quiet. A little bit of light is going to disrupt your sleep more than it might somebody else. Little noises may disrupt your sleep because you're in this heightened this heightened condition where your body is going to over-respond to minor stimuli. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have sleep apnea, you should, of course, treat your sleep apnea, but only if it's significant. So I often will see patients who have a pretty trivial amount of sleep apnea, but because that's the only thing the sleep physician recognizes being abnormal with their study, they're still advised to get a CPAP mask uh, and get a machine, which surprisingly doesn't really help the quality of their sleep. Similarly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I see patients with periodic limb movements, which do not cause arousals. Um, still being told that they should do something, they should take medications to treat that when that's really not necessary. So we often need medication, uh, again, to get a decent night's sleep. Uh, if your body's cranking out adrenaline, if you're in pain and that's what's disrupting your sleep, you're going to need medication to um, correct those problems. And typically, uh, most patients will need a combination of several things with complementary effects. So a patient might need uh, a couple of different pain medications, say a regular pain medication and a muscle relaxant. They might need something like a beta blocker to reduce the adrenaline and reduce the arousals. They might need another medication to increase deep sleep. Uh, so a combination of four or five things is often necessary. But when you find the right combination and you start sleeping well, then everything else gets better. Unfortunately, finding the right combination, as we mentioned earlier, uh, everybody's different. Finding the right combination can be a very frustrating trial and error process for doctor and patient alike. So among the medications we have to choose from for improving non-restorative sleep are beta blockers, which block adrenaline to reduce the, the arousals and to calm down the heart that's racing during the night when it shouldn't be. Uh, medications like trazodone, amitriptyline, and doxepin, which tend to increase deep sleep. Pain medications are very important. Most people underestimate how much pain is disrupting their sleep, uh, and often that's the first thing I'll do when I see somebody who's not sleeping well is suggest that they take pain medication at night to see if that improves the quality of their sleep because they'll often see a difference in the first night. Um, muscle relaxants, again, can improve the quality of sleep, can reduce the tendency of muscles that have been strained during the course of the day to tighten up overnight and cause pain. This is where occasionally benzodiazepines are helpful. I tend to use ones that don't last very long so that feeling, hang, feeling hungover in the morning is not a problem. Uh, but benzodiazepines can uh, reduce anxiety. They're sedating. They can reduce movement. They can antagonize extra adrenaline. Uh, they have many potentially beneficial effects for sleep. Uh, Neurontin and Lyrica improve both pain and sleep. Uh, clonidine is a drug that also can reduce arousals in patients who don't do well in beta blockers. Uh, alpha blockers are an interesting class of drugs that were used to designed to treat high blood pressure 50 years ago and have been found to reduce the intensity of dreams in patients with vivid dreams and flashbacks and nightmares and things like that. So some people will need, some, will need alpha blockers in addition to a beta blocker or in addition to their other medications. And usually those are folks who wake up in the morning and say, oh, yeah, I had, you know, three or four wild dreams, and they remember every single detail of multiple dreams during the course of the night. And, of course, if you're doing that, you're not sleeping well. Uh, melatonin, the melatonin analog rosarum, can be helpful in helping with circadian rhythm problems. Uh, and the most common scenario there is people who get a second wind late in the evening. For some people, it's their first wind, but many people will get through most of the day, have a lull late afternoon, early evening, and then find that between 9 and 10 at night, 9 and 10 at night, their energy level picks back up, and just when they're trying to go to bed is when they're the most awake and alert they've been all day. So, and then sleeping pills I add, again here, as I added the benzodiazepines on my depression slide to, <laughs> to uh, 
to make the point that they're not helpful, uh, that your typical sleeping pills like Ambien and Lista and, Lista and Sonata do not reduce arousals. They do not increase deep sleep. Uh, they're really not correcting the underlying problem. Occasionally, they're helpful for people who just can't get to sleep, but you need to recognize that it's really not fixing what's wrong with your sleep. Okay, so how do we how do we reduce fatigue? Um, sounds sounds pretty obvious. Get adequate rest, but again, pushing through fatigue is something I see patients do all the time. Uh, and I saw a couple of people today who uh, again told me the benefits of taking short breaks or what I call timeouts. Many patients say, "Well, I'm I'm too busy. I can't rest. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I, I, there's always something I need to do." And I encourage them to take a two, three, five minute break in between their activities just to let the motor cool off a little bit, just to relax so they're not constantly under the gun, so they don't have their, their foot on the gas nonstop all day long. Uh, and I've been surprised in the few years I've been recommending that, that patients come back and they say it really does make a difference. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, exercise is an important way to reduce fatigue. Even if you don't have the energy to do what somebody else might think of as exercise, uh, Lying on your floor, lying on the floor and moving your arms and legs around may be, you know, the limit of your exercise. Lying on your back and bicycling with your legs for 30 seconds may be the limit of your exercise. Um, but something is better than nothing. Uh, stimulants can be helpful, um, especially in people who wake up tired and drag through the day and don't wake up till late in the day because then they're going to have trouble falling asleep at a normal sleep time. Uh, they also, a lot of patients find that they will help them be more productive with the limited amount of energy that they do have. Uh, the flip side of that is if you're taking stimulants to plow through the fatigue, it's just going to make, you're making a bad situation worse. Um, and, and when I see patients who are doing that, then they're stuck because if they stop their stimulants, they feel terrible because they're used to being on them. And if they keep taking stimulants, they're making a bad situation worse, and they're never going to get better. Uh, so try to be very, be very careful uh, with the use of stimulants. Uh, many of the antidepressants have some energizing qualities. Um, other simple ways we talked about, obviously looking for deficiencies of micronutrients, replacing them, and getting adequate salt and fluid uh, are all important measures to reduce fatigue. All right, there's specific treatments for autonomic dysfunction. Well, if you remember the cartoon with the pool, the long term, we're going to fix autonomic dysfunction by improving the quality of sleep and replenishing the pool by reducing the drains, increasing the input and reducing the output. Short term, uh, it's very often necessary to use medications like beta blockers or uh, clonidine and guanfacine, which are also drugs that, that suppress um, adrenaline to reduce this tendency to over-respond to stresses and allow your body to conserve the, the energy that you have. Occasionally, low doses of serotonin-type antidepressants, and by low dose, we're talking about a half to a quarter of the standard antidepressant dose can be useful to offset the tendency to be hyper and feel jittery all the time. Uh, and I talked about using alpha blockers to reduce the hyperarousal at night that's associated with vivid dreams. So, how do we break the cycle of chronic pain, poor sleep, fatigue, and depression? Well, we've got to go through them one by one and identify as many of the contributing factors as we can, treat them as best we can, address everything in a comprehensive program as best we can, and we get back to this and say, okay, this is what I need to do. When I see patients who have been making progress and then something's getting worse, it almost always comes down to this. They've either let their pain get out of control, uh, something stressful happened and they didn't get as much rest as they should, uh, they got dehydrated, uh, something stressful happened at home or at work. Usually there's an obvious explanation for why things have gotten worse and then an easy way to address how to get them better. So once you do all that, then you could start to get the vicious cycle going back the other way. If you have less pain, you'll sleep better, you'll have more energy, your mood improves, you'll do more. The more you do, the better you feel. The more you do, the better you sleep. Your mood improves, your overall energy improves. Um, pain gets better, you'll have less depression, less fatigue, sleep will all get better. As your depression gets better, 
pain, sleep, and fatigue will get better. As sleep improves, fatigue, depression, and pain get better. As fatigue improves, everything else, you'll do more and feel better. And the vicious cycle is reversed, and that is how you get better. So thanks for your attention. Uh, hope I left plenty of time for questions. I guess I'm supposed to click on the questions now. Yes, you Boy. can click on the Q&A button at the top um, to yeah. reading the questions. Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> Some of these questions look like they're long. Uh, so, first question is, I hope these are coming up in the order that they were posed. Uh, do you think that I was down with syndrome? Can you all see these questions on your screen? N no, only, only you okay. will see the questions. Okay, so let me read them. Do you think that Ehlers Danlos Syndrome related severe chronic pain should be treated with various opioids? If yes, why? If no, why not? Uh, right, so as I mentioned in my one slide of pain medications, uh, I will do everything I can to avoid using opioids use all the non-pharmacologic measures that are available to us, then start with milder medications first, um, and go through the list of available analgesics that we have. Most people will find that a lot of them don't work and or they have bad reactions to them. Uh, and if you've been through that short list of Tylenol and Tramadol, the anti-inflammatories, the muscle relaxants, uh, Cymbalta and Civella, Lyrica and Neurontin, then your next step is narcotics. Uh, and so a fair number of patients do need narcotics, uh, often just short term, to break the cycle. Again, if you're in pain and your pain is not controlled, nothing else is going to get better. Um, and that's a lot of people, you know, uh, are very hesitant to take narcotics, and we are reluctant to prescribe them. But in situations where pain control is what's really needed to, to get people feeling better, um, they are occasionally uh, I said not occasionally, they are frequently useful. Um, with respect to mast cell activation disorder, mast cell cytosis, and allergic reactions to medications, and pain management medications, what would you suggest be affected by this use to treat pain? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> allergic reactions to medication is a major problem for people with, with mast cell dysfunction. Um, you know, pre-treating with having lots of antihistamines in your system can reduce that. Um, a lot of patients react to binders and fillers in medications, and so sometimes uh, using compounded medications that just have the active ingredient and few or no additional ingredients can can uh, get around the problem of um, allergic reactions. Um, the other, no, I guess it's just uh, dealing with allergic reactions. Um, okay, the next question. How do we best help our daughter with POTS and to go to sleep at night so she doesn't stay up late and sleep most of the day? Um, the most effective thing, I would say, uh, is using beta blockers uh, at bedtime or in the evening. And if, if people are, if you're somebody who gets a second wind between 9 and 10 o'clock, you've been dragging through the evening, and then suddenly you start to feel more awake just when you're supposed to be getting ready for bed, then you want to take your beta blocker uh, before that. So usually that second wind occurs between 9 and 10, so you want to have something in your system beforehand. Um, and then trying to, usually that's the problem in people who then stay up late, because that's when they feel best is 11, 12 o'clock at night. Uh, but you want to take beta blockers earlier in the evening to suppress that adrenaline surge so that's not disrupting your sleep and so that energy is still in the tank the next day. Okay. Um, Somebody's asking for where to find a knowledgeable doctor in Oklahoma. That's something I refer to EDS Awareness dot <laughs> website. Uh, I don't know if there's a nearby support group. Um, are there any medications for uh, hypermobile asthma pain that work well but don't cause terrible side effects? Uh, again, this is, it's a very individual thing. Um, I've been, for a little over a year now, I've been doing uh, so-called pharmacogenetic testing in patients who have a history of 
multiple medication intolerances or drugs that don't work or I'm really sensitive to small doses of this or I took a big dose of that but it didn't help. Um, a lot of times that's the explanation for uh, adverse effects to medications. Um, other suggestions for for managing pain for intolerance to side effects uh, can be starting at really tiny doses so that you know, if the standard dose of a medication is 10 milligrams, you can start with one milligram uh, and very slowly increase your dose. Uh, often, it's suddenly dumping a whole bunch of some foreign substance in that can cause a that can cause a reaction, and introducing it little by little um, can be a way around that. Um, let's see. Oops, I think I just skipped a couple. Sorry, I'm trying to go back here. Uh, yeah, I think you're about where it says about magnesium oxide for slow bowel. There we go. Okay. Sorry. I don't know how I missed that. So about magnesium oxide for slow bowel transit, is it beneficial? Well, generally magnesium has a laxative effect. Uh, uh, magnesium oxide probably doesn't have the most uh, lactic effect. Probably, um, oh, there are other there. There's variability among the the magnesium salts. Uh, magnesium citrate is probably one that's used most commonly uh, for its lactic effect. Um, can magnesium cause the muscles to relax too much? Uh, no, I've never seen that uh, in anybody with normal kidney function. It's almost impossible to get too much magnesium. In fact, the opposite of the problem, opposite is the problem that if you're low in magnesium, your body can only absorb a little bit, and it's, it can take forever to, to replenish the deficiency. Are there medicines for depression or medicines for pain that are contraindicated in the treatment of patients with Um No, I think the point I would make is that everybody's different. Uh, and different medications are going to work better for different people. I, I can't think of anything offhand um, that would be, you know, absolutely contraindicated. Um, you know, the only thing occasionally you need to be wary of muscle relaxants. It's uncommon, but there are patients who find that muscle relaxants will relax the muscles too much uh, and make their and make their joints looser. Um, other than that, I can't think of any medications that would be just, in general, contraindicated for everybody. And I just skipped a question again. And just, just a comment, there is a very strong group in New York, and you can go out to our map and get a hold of Kurt in New York City. How am I losing these questions? Uh, Okay, is melatonin good or bad? Um, again, it varies. I, I, theoretically, um, the experts say that you only need something like a tenth of a milligram of melatonin to bind up all your melatonin receptors. And yet I see patients who tell me that 15 milligrams of melatonin really helps them sleep. Um, so I don't, it's one of those things that's generally pretty safe and you can try it and see if it helps. It's generally a small part of a of a sleep regimen. Uh, it's not going to reduce arousals. It's not going to increase deep sleep. Uh, it can help with circadian rhythms and telling your body that may want to be wide awake late at night that it's actually time for time for bed to relax. Uh, 19-year-old with Ehlers-Danlos loss and dysautonomia never wakes spontaneously, so he sleeps 11 hours a night. He's had brain fog, limited stamina. I'm having trouble with these uh, questions here. Um, I just had a nomi doctor diagnosed with hyper, I believe that's hyperadrenergic pots, but beta blockers. That alpha tagging already doesn't think there's more she can do. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that's the kind of I think individual advice that's sort of beyond the, the scope of our of our talk here tonight. Um, I think he might try to he might go and have a sleep study 
and try to find a sleep specialist to help uh, identify exactly what's wrong with his sleep and why he sleeps 11 hours and, and so tired. Uh, question about lack of blood flow in its relation to pain. Um, what I mentioned there was that um, in um, uh, for visceral pain, the internal organs, uh, certainly people are familiar with uh, uh, heart disease, coronary disease, heart attacks, uh, patients get chest pain because there's not enough blood flow to the heart muscle. Uh, similarly, blood flow, lack of blood flow to the intestines can cause abdominal pain. It can be very hard to diagnose. Um, I think that's what I had, that's what I uh, was referring to when I talked about lack of blood flow in, in relation to pain. Next question, my rheumatologist. suggested acupuncture. Is it helpful in terms of pay for it's expensive? Uh, my experience with acupuncture is patients get short-term relief from it, um, but I don't see a lot of people get long-term lasting benefit. So they may go to acupuncture, you know, on a regular basis to keep their pain under control. Um, but it's kind of, to me, it's kind of like taking a sleeping pill for sleep. It may help you feel better, but I don't think it's correcting the underlying problem. So if you need acupuncture to relax your muscles so that you can exercise them without hurting them, then that may be a useful way for, for acupuncture to be part of a treatment program. Can we check through blood or urine for deficiencies that cause anxiety and depression? Uh, I believe the answer is yes. It's not technology that I'm familiar with. I've seen patients go to naturopaths and have urine tests for things like serotonin. Uh, it's not something that I do or, or that I'm familiar with. I used to suggest this Zio Home Sleep Monitor. Right, Zio was very helpful. Right, Zio is out of business. Um, sleep apnea in this. Right, so of the currently available things, the, the monitor I have the most hope for is the, is the BASIS, B-A-S-I-S, um, which has the most sophisticated sleep monitoring technology. Uh, and I've recently seen a couple of patients come in with their with their basis monitors, and they do have uh, graphs of what look like sleep stages. And the basis, I think, also can record heart rate overnight. And as you might recall from the couple of pictures I showed you, uh, heart rate can be a pretty good proxy for what's going on with your sleep. If your if your heart is calm and quiet, then your body's sleeping okay. If your heart rate is bouncing up and down all night, then you've got autonomic problems that are disrupting your sleep or pain. I wake. I never sleep deeply. I wake from every whisper. I have vivid nightmares all night, and I'm tired all day long. But I can only fall asleep when I'm extremely tired, usually very early late at night. So even hours of deep sleep are not much, and I can't fall asleep during the day. Um, right. Yeah, this is a situation where uh, somebody's going to need a fair amount of medication at night. Um, there may be undertreated pain that's an issue underlying the adrenaline that's causing the shallow sleep in the dreams. Uh, if pain's not an issue, then um, beta blockade and uh, alpha blockers, specifically prazosin, to reduce the vivid nightmares might be helpful. Uh, I wake up every morning with bedding all messed up. Do they cover off and linen half off? Is that a bad sign? Well, that's a sign of a restless sleeper. And so usually... Uh, the two main reasons people have restless sleep are they're in pain and they can't get comfortable. They roll over on a hip that hurts and then they roll over onto something else and a few minutes later that hurts and they have to move. Uh, or it can be a sign of what's called periodic limb movements of sleep, uh, which is a movement disorder that has specific treatments of its own. Uh, are MRIs useful? I would say I don't see a lot of patients who need MRIs. Um, generally, the soft tissue pain that people have is, is pretty obvious to tell on physical exam. You might need an MRI to confirm that you have a rotator cuff tear or something like that. Um, but I don't see the use of a lot of MRIs. The, the major place to use MRIs in the analysis is to look at uh, spinal cord problems and issues with the instability of the cervical spine and lumbar spine. What might cause heart rate to be in the 40s and 50s during sleep? I'm woken by pounding heart when my heart rate goes too low. 
Uh, the most common reason for the heart rate to get in the 40s and 50s during sleep is that it went up first and then came down. Um, and the the up can be very quick, and the down can then you can hit the gas and then hit the brake instant almost instantly afterwards, and then wake up with low heart rate, queasy, lightheaded, uh, or be woken up by your heart pounding because you're you've gone up, down, up, down, up, down. What medication do you take for fatigue days? We need to be alert and functioning. Um, the safest thing is to use sort of on an intermittent basis, you know, on days that you need to be alert and do something even when you're tired are, are probably a provigil and new vigil uh, because they're not physically stimulating. Uh, they're going to help you be more functional without further draining your reserves or making you feel like you have more energy than you really do. Um, but they are hit or miss. Some people find them very helpful and, and some people don't. Are there was a question about growth hormone. Okay. Nah, I've lost my I've lost my place in these questions, I'm sorry. Bear with me just a minute. Okay. I think I might have missed a couple here. How is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome different than fibromyalgia? Uh, well, it depends on whom you ask. <laughs> my, my, own, my own construct of fibromyalgia is that it is basically uh, a, a vicious cycle of chronic pain, poor sleep, fatigue, and depression. Um, uh, and my bias is that uh, I've never seen a fibromyalgia patient who wasn't hypermobile. Uh, so I think there's a, a lot of overlap. Uh, certainly, there are less down patients who don't have fibromyalgia, uh, who don't have uh, this this uh, uh, painful, vicious cycle. Um, but I think that's um, that's probably the simplest answer I can give for that. Uh, there's a long question about sleep medication. I was taking trazodone for three months. It was working well. I woke up and didn't feel like it just made it by a bus. But then had two month long brain fog, everything flare up and trazodone instantly stopped working. Um had no luck figuring out what was going on or what might have caused it. Trazodone went from amazing to worthless overnight. Do you have any possible ideas? Um my first thought is that what trazodone does is increasing deep sleep is increased deep sleep. So if this was a person that was stuck in shallow sleep all night, that trazodone might have increased their deep sleep and given them a restful night's sleep. But then there might have been a flare of pain or fatigue or something that then caused autonomic problems. And so now there's a problem of too much adrenaline that's disrupting sleep, and Drazenone is not going to do anything to, to counter that or offset that. Uh, I've suffered insomnia and poor sleep since age 14. I take Drazenone to sleep as possible, I'll still get poor sleep. It's like being on a sleep aid. Uh, Yes, it's right. So it is possible to be get poor sleep to be on three or four sleep aids and still get poor sleep. Uh, it's the problem is trying to find the right combination of uh, sleep medicines for for each individual. Um, how do I determine the cause of my insomnia? Again, it sounds like this person has not had a sleep study, and a sleep study would be really helpful. Um, what other micronutrient deficiencies do you check for? Um, I tend to look for all the B vitamins. Uh, the trace elements are also yeah, uh, zinc, uh, selenium, chromium, uh, as well as magnesium. Um, those are probably the, the common things I look for in addition to um, the B vitamins and vitamin D. Regular low testosterone in women is that treated with testosterone supplementation, and do OBGYNs usually do this routinely? Uh, 
No, I think many, if not most, WNs do not routinely monitor testosterone levels. Uh, there are no FDA approved. Well, besides ester test, which is an oral product, there are not any other. There are not any good oral um, FDA approved testosterone replacement products for women. Uh, my finding, my experience has been that um, at least half of the gynecologists that I often send my patients back to with their abnormal test results to discuss supplementation uh, either say, you know, no, I don't, that, that's not something I believe in or that's not something I, I feel comfortable doing, um, or they're reassured, oh, that's normal, you know, don't worry about it. Lots of people have low testosterone, lots of women have low testosterone. In fact, that's true that, that, that women who take birth control pills, their natural production of testosterone is suppressed. Uh, but in the setting of Bella Stanlos, I think, I think those women really do need some um, because they need it. It may help with mood, it may help with energy, and most importantly, it may help, may help build muscle. I was prescribed metoprolol for some heart issues. I was surprised to hear that beta blockers can help sleep. My sleep is terrible despite taking the beta blocker. Do you have any suggestions what I should do for my next step or why the beta blocker doesn't help my sleep? A uh, bunch of possibilities. It may be that adrenaline is not the problem that's disrupting your sleep. Uh, it may be that metoprolol is not the beta blocker for you. Uh, choosing beta blockers is a very trial and error proposition. There are differences among patients in how they metabolize beta blockers. And then we know there are genetic differences in, uh, in adrenaline receptors. Uh, different people respond better to different beta blockers. Uh, and that's unfortunately at, 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 in this, uh, uh, in this time, uh, we don't have the technology to test that. We just have to try different beta blockers and, and pick one that helps. Uh, based on patient response. Um, have you found a correlation with Ehlers-Danlos and fibromyalgia? And I think that was going to say chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, yeah, so chronic fatigue, and I think the patient, I think whoever was asking this, so, probably meant chronic fatigue syndrome. So, yeah, I talked about Ehlers-Danlos and fibromyalgia. Uh, again, I've been studying chronic fatigue syndrome since 1987, and my bias is that I haven't seen a chronic fatigue patient in more than 10 years who was not hypermobile. And in fact, the last several patients referred to me for treatment of their CFS didn't have CFS. They had Ehlers-Danlos. So the important thing to recognize is that chronic fatigue syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to rule out other conditions that might explain the patient's symptoms. Um, and certainly, if you look at the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome, you will see a lot of overlap with the symptoms of Ehlers Uh That's not a, uh, uh, not a consensus opinion in the chronic fatigue syndrome community, I would say. Um, where to start pain or pain plus depression and which tests to run first pass? Um, uh, if I had to pick one, usually pain management is what comes first, uh, that most people are just in more pain than they realize, and that's a major factor in their fatigue and their sleep and their depression. Um, next question is, I hope I'm getting near the end here. My is 13, hyperglyphs, down hand pots, chronic neck and shoulder blade, muscle spasms, he wakes frequently at night, though he doesn't remember. He takes melatonin and very other meds because doctors have tried gabapentin and clonopin, and it just made him sleepy and gain weight. Um, again, it sounds like a sleep study would be helpful to see what's disrupting his sleep. If he has frequent arousals, he might need uh, a beta blocker to reduce the arousal. Since he's aware of waking frequently, you'll, re you'll recall the patient I showed you who was aware of waking up twice, who actually woke up 23 times. So uh, he may very well need a beta blocker, and he may very well need something to increase deep sleep. Uh, that the standard sleeping pills may just not be addressing what's wrong with his sleep. Um, if you experience fairly constant nausea, is there any type of diet that is helpful? Uh, that's hard. I think if you, um, my my bias, especially given the topics we've just discussed, is that, and the patients I've seen, these three people I've seen in the past week with severe nausea, that was autonomic. So a lot of times fairly constant nausea can be a sign of autonomic problems, uh, specifically pain and fatigue causing too much sympathetic activity, and the body responds by hitting the brakes with nausea. 
Um, so I don't have any particular type of diet that's helpful. I mean, we're going to stick with small meals and things that are easy to digest. Um, okay. Thank you for your talk. You've put a name to much of what I experienced. I'm now better able to see my doctors about my symptoms. None of my doctors knows or understands that I understand what they think is merely arthritis, a psychiatrist. Oh, no, I don't believe this. Um, how I can educate my doctors. Uh, <laughs> encourage them but just to participate in educational activities like this. Uh, next month there is going to be the first uh, CME conference at the new Alex Danlos Research Center in Baltimore. Uh, and that, um, I don't know if it's going to be broadcast live on the web. It certainly will be recorded. Um, and that's uh, um, our, our first attempt with this new center uh, to try to do some outreach to do some physician education in, a, in an organized way. Um, yeah, it's a it's a problem for, you know, uh, for the whole specialty. Uh, there's a backlash against the use of opioids. Right, so there's a place for opioids. Uh, opioids are the only thing that helped my level of pain. Um, yeah, it's a problem. I have patients who need opioids, and they have they have pain doctors who won't prescribe their opioids. Um, it's a difficult problem. We're trying to do um, uh, in the works. There's a, I think a primary care uh, program trying to teach primary care doctors to feel more comfortable managing pain. Um, yeah, I have many patients who get to the point that opioids are the only things that work, and opioids make a huge difference in their life, and then they have trouble finding somebody who's willing to prescribe them. Um, I don't have a great, sorry, that's almost a political problem that I don't have a good solution for. Um, uh, let's see, sorry, I think I missed one in there. Do all types of ALS downloads have the same symptoms? So I've got a hypermobile ALS downloads. Um, I was talking primarily about hypermobile ALS downloads, but, but other types, certainly the classical types are, are very similar. Uh, vascular has a lot of different different manifestations, but um, do some patients have a greater tolerance and therefore an increased need for higher levels of opioids? Yes, um, uh, a major common problem with opioids uh, is, is a pharmacogenetic issue that the common narcotics, uh, oxycodone and hydrocodone, Vicodin and Percocet, uh, actually need to be metabolized into more active, more potent forms by the body. Uh, and a fair number of people are uh, don't make that conversion well, and so they are less responsive to those drugs. Um, and then just presumably the level of binding of opioids to receptors in the brain, uh, some patients need a higher level of medication to get the same relief that somebody else does. Uh, tolerance is a different issue. Tolerance is actually a term we use for people who've been on opioids a long, term, a long time and become tolerant to them, meaning that they gradually need more and more medication to, reach, to achieve the same level of pain relief. Is it a bad idea for those patients patients to get too many cortisone injections? Um, not a big fan of cortisone injections. Most of the pain in the other stanless patients uh, is in the soft tissues, and injecting cortisone into the soft tissues can weaken them. So not a great idea. If you have an inflamed joint, uh, then cortisone in the joint can reduce inflammation. But I'm not a big fan of, of cortisone injections for soft tissue pain. Can you actually cure dysautonomia or just control it? Um, well, I didn't include it, but somewhere I have a before and after slide that shows that um, to make the point that, that most autonomic dysfunction is reversible, that it's an imbalance. Uh, if you're able to get a decent restful night's sleep and get adequate pain relief, um, and I've seen several patients recently that are, have reduced or are off their daytime beta blockers that uh, are having fewer and fewer autonomic problems uh, as they get more better, as they get more sleep, as they get more good quality sleep, and as they have um, more uh, pain-free days. Um, so I'm, um, yes, you know, you have, you'll always have a tendency to dysautonomia, uh, but certainly I see people who, uh, whose dysautonomia improves to the point that they're able to manage it without medication. Uh, would myofascial pain follow muscle joint or visceral? Myofascial pain is, is muscle and joint pain. It's, it's musculoskeletal pain. Um, 
I experience a great deal of distractibility. I can't stay focused. Is ADD related to autonomic instability? Can it be treated like ADD in non-EDS patients? Um, it's interesting. Um, basically, if you don't sleep well for a long period of time, uh, you will have pretty much all the symptoms of ADD. Uh, and there are some studies of ADD with kids showing that uh, 30 to 40 percent of them will have abnormal sleep studies uh, and often correcting their sleep studies. In fact, one of the things that got me interested in this was um, in the early lectures that I, I gave at various meetings, uh, parents would come up to me and say, gee, that was interesting, you know, what you said about ADD because uh, once, my, once we got my son's uh, sleep under control, he didn't have ADD anymore. Uh, or once we got my daughter's uh, sleep straight and once we got my daughter's pain under control, she didn't have anxiety anymore. Um, so uh, I think a lot of the distractibility comes from either being in pain and or being exhausted. Um, and in that sense, the treatment is going to be different. The treatment is going to be treating the underlying problems. Uh, treating ADD with stimulants can aggravate autonomic dysfunction and can aggravate fatigue. So uh, it's very tricky, um, and this is another whole hour-long lecture that I gave last year at the Arstanalyst meetings uh, on how easy it is to mistake autonomic problems for, for psychiatric problems. Um, but you need to be careful that uh, there isn't an underlying problem like lack of sleep that's causing the distractibility and the ADD symptoms. If I'm not supposed to take sleeping pill like trazodone because it's not really dealing with the problem, how do we treat insomnia when beta blockers that are done far enough are already being used? Well, no, trazodone is fine, but trazodone just does one particular thing. It tends to increase deep sleep. Um, so I think, again, the question is if you're taking trazodone and taking beta blockers and still not sleeping well, there's something else going on, perhaps pain uh, or perhaps the beta blocker this, the particular beta blocker this person is taking is not the is not the best one for them. Uh, what should we have sleep specialists look for? So I think I mentioned the big things there to look for uh, the number of arousals, especially spontaneous arousals, and to look for the percentage of deep sleep. So it's very various neurotransmitters. I've had bad reactions to antidepressants. Is there something else you might suggest trying? Um, uh, I guess one thing that I would mention in terms of people who have bad reactions to antidepressants, um, uh, something that I explain to people, say, for example, uh, we know that chronic pain tends to deplete serotonin. If you're deficient in serotonin, your body will make certain adjustments and compensations and adaptations to try to manage with very little serotonin. If you then suddenly take a normal dose of a serotonin reuptake inhibitor and flood your body with tons more serotonin than it's used to seeing, you're going to feel sick. You're going to feel drugged. You're going to feel nauseous. You're going to say, forget it. I can't take this. Uh, so this is another situation where I will start people, say, on you know one milligram of an antidepressant where 10 milligrams might be the normal starting dose uh, and have them slowly increase the dose. Uh, especially my use of antidepressants in mitochondrial disorders that I don't know anything about. Uh, I'm running out of steam here. I think we're hopefully we're running out of time. Uh, whoops. Sorry, I lost the question again. Uh, there are no clinical centers in New York. Uh, I think, John, you mentioned uh, the New York area support group. How do we find a balance between using beta blockers for sleep and dealing with fatigue associated with beta blockers? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and the answer is that basically... What you want to do is take enough beta blocker during the day to suppress your body's tendency to overreact to minor stresses, but not so much that it blocks the adrenaline that you need to, to function. So uh, you want to take sort of as much as you can during the day to the point that it starts to make you feel sluggish and then back off a little bit, whereas at night you want to block it all. Uh, so very often the, the most helpful way to do that is to take 
a, a twice daily beta blocker. We would take a small amount in the morning and take it three or four times as much in the evening, uh, or to take a long-acting beta blocker, such as metoprolol, which comes in long-acting and short-acting forms. Take a small dose of the long-acting, so you have a little bit in your system all day and night, and then take extra of the short-acting beta blocker at night. All right, tell somebody asked about his three-year-old son. I don't, I don't do pediatrics. I can't help with that one. Um, lidocaine, a recent time for treating fibromyalgia, is being good. Um, right, so it's well documented that EDS patients have a lot of lidocaine to work. How would this work that their EDS patients it does? So the lidocaine issue is a pharmacogenetic issue that... There are a lot of Alistanilis patients who are fast metabolizers of lidocaine and that family of local anesthetics, and they find that out when they go to the dentist, and the Novocaine wears off very fast. Uh, there are plenty of Alistanilis patients who are not fast metabolizers of lidocaine, and it works fine for them. Uh, there are people who are fast metabolizers of lidocaine who still do well with topical lidocaine products, uh, with the lidocaine patches or, or topical compounded lidocaine creams. Um, so it can be a, a very helpful drug. Uh, for my depression, I'm on Prestique, Wellbutrin, and Synthroid, as well as Modafinil for energy. And I also take Propranol, Almidogen, and Florinef. Does that seem excessive? Um, the other thing I'd say about that is that um, I see a lot of patients with autonomic problems and orthostatic intolerance and POTS. Um, and that's why I put in a couple extra slides with the details about salt and fluid balance, because I find that very few of these of, of patients need midodrin and Florinef. Uh, Florinef tricks the kidney into retaining salt and fluid. There's nothing wrong with the kidney. The kidney doesn't need to be tricked into holding onto salt. It just needs to get more salt. Uh, and most patients, patients are not getting more salt. Um, Midodrin, when the blood pressure goes up and then crashing back down, midodrin raises the floor so you don't fall as far. Um, but typically, if the appropriate beta blocker and the appropriate dose blocks the up, then you won't get the down and you won't need midodrin. So um, I generally have, you know, a lot of patients who have these problems, and I have very few who are on uh, who are on midodrin and Florinus. So that's. Not to second guess what your doctor is doing, but that would be my, my only reaction to your list of medications. Um, what type of magnesium is best for magnesium deficiency? Actually, uh, I'm not aware of any studies that anybody's done to try and look. Um, there are some like magnesium malate that tend to cause less diarrhea. Uh, there are topical magnesium lotions. Uh, soaking in Epsom salts is a very good way uh, uh, to get magnesium because you bypass the GI problems and absorb it very well through your skin. Okay, what about menthol creams? <laughs> menthol creams, I don't know. Uh, I think different things work for different people. Menthol helps you with pain relief. Uh, that I, I'm not aware of any adverse reactions to that. Um, Okay, maybe last question here. My doctors are pretty much overwhelmed with my symptoms regarding autonomic dysfunction, chronic fatigue, and poor sleep. What are the first three steps you would take to evaluate this? Um, well, I think the first thing would be the sleep study um, because that may be underlying a lot of the fatigue and autonomic dysfunction. Um, I probably would look at, uh, do the salt fluid testing to see if, um, if that's something that could correct both fatigue and autonomic dysfunction. Okay, I think I'm at the end of the list. That was the end of the list. He, he made okay. it through. Thank you for your endurance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your attention and hope this was helpful. Yeah, I wanted to let you know everybody's giving a resounding um, feedback as far as, um, you know, everything that you covered on the webinar in the content they say is the story of their life, and you've just yeah, explained good. a lot of things. So you probably already yeah. hear this from your patients, but everybody Right, but that's, very... you know, that's why it, you know, this is a great opportunity. This is a great format for people to say, oh, you know, so there's a reason I have this. There's a reason I do this. There's, you know, there's a reason this happens, uh, and that, that helps a lot of people. So.
Yeah, we had That's over important. ninety over ninety people live in the call, and we had um, uh, kind of a roll call of, of of many people who were who were just confirming that you know that everything you explained really helped them a lot. Great. Um, and um, I did have a couple of people asking if you see patients from out of state, which I believe you do. Yeah, no, I, I'm not taking new patients right now. Okay. I don't have anywhere to, yeah, my schedule's full into January. I don't have room to put the patients that I already have now, so I just don't have anywhere to see new patients right now. Okay. Sorry. Well, we certainly we certainly enjoyed the presentation, and, and <laughs> as Deanna was saying, it's just uh, so over overwhelming how helpful this kind of information is, and it's obvious that you really understand the needs of the eds -er, and it's hard to find doctors that really can understand it as well as you do, right. so we really, right. really, really appreciate it. Oh, well, you're welcome. Glad to, glad to help. Yeah, I mean, it's good to have this out there, because then I, mean, <laughs> I can send my patients <laughs> To the site, I say, you know, especially, or send them to their family members to say, you know, sit down with your with your folks and you know go through this, and so they yes. can understand what's going on with all these symptoms. So right, right, all right. Fabulous. Glad okay, so well, yeah. all right. we're going to oh, I didn't miss too many questions. I had trouble. I had trouble surfing through the questions. I kept jumping over some, so I hope I didn't miss I, too many. But I think you've uh, got all but maybe a couple of them, and okay. we. We understand there were there were over uh, 66 questions, so you okay. were okay. very thorough in getting <laughs> through them. So that's incredible, that's okay. incredible. All right, and we are going to wrap up the recording for this evening. I just wanted to remind everyone that our next presentation will be on September 3rd, uh, Dr. Mentner. So please uh, look forward to uh, attending that. If you'd like to be on our mailing list so that you can get uh, the announcements for these meetings, please request the free report on our site. And the recording and the uh, slides will be posted on our site uh, tomorrow. So, again, thank you all, and have a good evening. Thank right. you so much, Dr. Pasinki. You're welcome. Thank it. you, guys. Uh -huh. Bye. Good night.